Praise the Lord. Everybody I said, praise the Lord. The Lord bless everyone today in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. And we're asking, O oh Lord, you touch every heart and touch every soul and touch every life today in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you open our eyes of understanding so that everything we ought to know, everything we ought to have, everything we ought to believe, everything we ought to embrace, everything we ought to do, you grant us the grace to have them in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, as we come day after day and week after week and month after month, Lord, we pray we'll grow up to be matured people in Christ in Jesus' name. And I pray that none of us will ever remain the same. Your power in every life, your light in every life, your grace in every life and everything that you have given us, the fulfillment of promises in every life, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Another amen. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're looking at verse 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And then he tells us in verse 13, it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. By one spirit we are baptized into one body. That word baptize. As you look at that word, there is the water baptism. The water baptism is not done by the Holy Ghost. The water baptism is done by the minister, by the pastor, by the preacher. He baptizes us into water in identification with the Lord Jesus Christ, identifying with his death, his burial, and resurrection, water baptism. Then there is the other baptism by the Spirit, by one Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, he takes us and he mercies us, integrates us into the body of Christ. We're born again. We're children of God. And because of that new birth experience, he brings us to become part and parcel, built up with the holy temple, that is the temple, the body of Christ. That's another baptism. Then there is the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Understand, water baptism is done by a man, the minister. The one integrating us into the body of Christ, that is done by the Spirit. Now, the Spirit baptism. The baptism in the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Baptizer in the Holy Ghost. It takes the believer, saved, sanctified, already part of the body of Christ, and he baptizes us with the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Ghost. And now he tells us, as members of the church, and we're part of the church, it says, by one spirit, and we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you drink of the Holy Spirit. If anyone is a thirst, let him come unto me and drink, because he has not uh, baptized the people of the Holy Ghost. He said, they speak him of the Spirit of God that shall come to us and dwell in us. 
because he was not yet glorified, he was glorified, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptism means immersion. When you take a glass of water and you put it in a bucket of water, you immerse it, you surround it with water, you baptize that glass with water, and then the water will be inside and around the glass. The same thing for a child of God, you are born again, you are sanctified, and you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is in you. You are made to drink into one spirit, and then it's all around you, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Water baptism. Have you been baptized in water? Baptism into Christ, into the body. Are you integrated into the body? And then the baptism, the power, the immersion in the Holy Ghost. It shall be indeed with power from on high. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for the body is not one member. The body is not one member. What does that mean? If the head is just moving around, no neck, no hands, no feet, that will be weird. Everybody will run away. If the body has head, but there are no hands, and then it's just going about, you won't be able to do everything you ought to do. The body is not one member, but many. And then it tells us all those many members, external ones, visible ones, internal ones, invisible ones, all those members of the body, they work together. They are different one from the other. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, he's telling us now members of the body. In verse 15, if the food shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, he said, therefore not of the body. There is no superiority, there is no inferiority. The food is part of the body. And then also the hand, part of the body. Look at verse 16 there. In verse 16, if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. He said, therefore not of the body. The eye is there. And then the ear is also there. In verse 17, it says, if the whole body were an eye, where was the hearing? And if the whole body were hearing, where were they smelling? It says we have five senses to see, to hear, to smell, to touch, to taste, and then we move about. It says all those members of the body are very important and they're very essential. And it says this is the work of God, is the arrangement of God. Look at verse 18. It says in verse 18, but now, as God said, members, every one of them in the body. It says, don't concentrate only on one. And don't nullify, don't destroy the ministry of the ear and the eye, or the mouth, or the feet, or the hands, or the levers, or the kidneys, everyone, all the parts have their function to play. And then when we so much appreciate a single member of the body and then transfer all the functions of all the other areas on just one member of the church, even the head. The hand says, the head is so important, I'll not do my duty, let the head do that. The ear says, I am not the head, let the head do that. And then the mouth says, let the head do that. If all the members transfer 
all the responsibilities of all the members of the body. If we transfer it to the head, we negate the plan of God and the purpose of God. And we negate the usefulness of all the members of the church. What the Lord is saying is, we don't direct everything the body has to do to the leader of the church, to the pastor of the church, or to the GS. If we want to do this, head. If we want to go here, head. If we want to handle this, head. If we want to do anything, head. It says every member has its function. You perform your role. I perform my role. And it is like that all the members of the body will be useful, will be united, and then will be profitable. I pray you'll be profitable in Jesus' name. Give me deeper life headquarters. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ, you, the church, you, the members, you, the ones who are saved, and you are baptized into the body of Christ. It says, Ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, And God has set some, and God has said, Not one, some. If we understand God, and we're moving with God, and we're living in God, and we center our understanding on what God has said, and God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, that means you can walk miracles without being an apostle. After that, miracles, that means you can pray. A miracle can happen without you being a prophet. After that, miracles, that means you can pray and move the hand that works miracle in your own life and in my life and in lives of other people without being a teacher. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing. That means the gifts of healing, they're not limited to the apostle. After that, and then, they're not limited to the prophets. After that, and then, they're not limited to the teachers. After that, and then, gifts of healing helps. Helps. Somebody needs close to where? Helps. Somebody needs accommodation? Helps. Somebody needs food? Helps. Somebody needs upliftment and encouragement? Helps. Everything does not go to the apostle. Everything is not centered on the apostles. After that, we have helps and governments. That's administration. Put that chair there. Put that bench there. Write that letter to the stage and get this information out, administration, government, and then the adversities of tongues. And I pray the Lord, as he teaches us, and we understand the truth, I pray we will live and walk by the truth in Jesus' name. Somebody must say amen. The message today, the unity and usefulness of members in Christ. The unity and usefulness of members in Christ. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the uniqueness of born again members in Christ. Unique. Different from the world. Different from their past. Different from the sinners unique 
the uniqueness of born again members in Christ. Number two, the oneness of baptized, built up members in his church. When we're born again, you repent, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you are baptized in water. And then you are built into, you are immersed, you are integrated into the body of Christ, built as a holy temple unto the Lord. The foundation and the cornerstone being the Lord Jesus Christ. The oneness of baptized, built up members in his church. Number three, the usefulness of body bearing members for the commission. Every member of the body, if you think about the body, every member of the body is supposed to be active, productive, and operational, functional, useful in the body. Whatever you are doing, think about that. If you're going to make progress in that assignment and in that work, you need the head, your brain, you need your eyes to see, you need your ears to hear instruction. You need your hands to move and to act. And you need your feet to carry you and move you to where you ought to be as to carry out the duty. Everyone useful in the kingdom. The usefulness of body bearers, body bearing members for the commission. Let's look at number one. Number one. The uniqueness of born again members in Christ. Look at John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it tells us again, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter, he cannot be integrated, he cannot become part of the kingdom of God. The first essential experience is that you are born again. You are turned around. You become a new creature in Christ. You cannot be a man, a natural man, and then enter into the kingdom. You cannot be a natural man and be a member of Christ. It, the natural man might be educated. Education does not make you a member of the body of Christ. The natural man might be intelligent. Intelligence does not make you a member of the body of Christ. That natural man may be morally good. Morals alone, without being born again, will not make you a member of the body of Christ. Intelligent, you need to be born again. Educated, you need to be born again. And you are morally good, you still need to be born again. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is when you turn away from darkness, you come into the light. You turn away from your past life and you come to Christ. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. Born again. You become a unique born again member in Christ. We're told in James chapter 1, reading from verse 18. James chapter 1, verse 18, it tells us that we are begotten. It says, of his own will, begot ye us by the word of truth. 
by, by the word of truth. We hear the word of truth. That's the word of salvation. That's the gospel of salvation. And that's the gospel that tells us that Christ and Christ alone is the Savior. We accepted that, we believe that, we confess that, and we came before the Lord, and then He wiped away all our past, and we are begotten of God by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Different, distinct, unique, totally and completely only separated unto the Lord. And then he tells us in verse 21, he says in verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness, not pride, and receive with meekness, not attitude of I know it all, I didn't come to hear the word of God. I just came. No, when you come, if you're a real child of God and you're begotten and you're born again and you're being taken out of the world and you're coming to the kingdom with meekness, you receive the word which is able to save your souls. Receive the word which is able to save your souls. What's the uniqueness of a real member of the body of Christ? The uniqueness is, is born again. Not everybody in the world is born again. And so if you are born again, you are unique. Not only that, it will be called out of the world, separated out of the world, and made different and distinct from the world. That's your uniqueness. Then you are a new creature in Christ. Old lifestyle is gone. A new lifestyle has come. And you can say by the grace of God, I used to be like this, but I'm no more like that. The alcohol I used to drink, I drink that no more. And the showy dress that will show all the, uh, all the contour of your body, the anatomy of your body, I wear that no more. And the lies I used to tell, I tell those no more. And the places I used to go, the places where the people of the world go for relaxation in the night, I go there no more. And the gang I used to belong to, I belong there no more. You're unique, you're different. The uniqueness of born again members in Christ. And now you have received the word of God engrafted in your soul, which is able to make you wise. Look at Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we're looking at verse 20. In Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You need, you know, the rest of the people, citizens of the world, they have their names registered in the world, or maybe they get their NIN, they have their name, their number, their picture captured for national utility. Or maybe you are a company, they put your name in the register of the company. That's everybody. Everybody does that. But the uniqueness is that your name is not only in the register of this world. Your name is written in the book of life in heaven. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. How do I know? If my name is written in heaven. Well, look at the world around you. Look at that thief. Look at that liar. Look at that deceiver. Look at that fighter. Look at that person that is taking everybody as enemy. Do you think their names are written in heaven? 
You say, I don't think so. The same thing with you. If you're just human, if you're carnal, if you're natural, if you're sinful, if you're transgressor, you know that your name is not there. It's the name of the people who have repented of their sins. They're born again and heaven recognizes them. And because heaven recognizes them, heaven registers them that the children of God and then the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart that you are a child of God and you rejoice. Angels are rejoicing already because you repented and the Father is joyful and, the, and Jesus Christ is happy and joyful and the saints of God are joyful and then in your heart the Holy Ghost registers that heaven rejoices because of you and now you can rejoice because your name is written in heaven and then you now begin to walk and live as a child of God. You just love to live right. That's the uniqueness. The people of the world, they love to fight. You love to do the things in the Word of God. That makes you different. That makes you unique. That makes you to be set apart from the people of the world. Look at First John chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That's unique. That's unique. If you take that away from the Christian experience, we're no more unique. If you say, well, I'm a member of the church, but there are some sins I cannot give up, you're not unique. And just like other people of the world, what makes them sinners? What makes them part of the world? Habits, character, behavior, action that you want to give up and so if you are not giving up anything and if you're just like them i like my bottle of alcohol i like my packet of cigarettes i like all my sin partners and i can't give up well you're just like them you're not born again if you are born again whosoever is born of god does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. I pray every one of us will have that experience in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil ah so there are children of the devil and then there are children of god all have sinned and come short of the glory of god ye of your father the devil and the works of your father ye will do and then when you want to come out of that camp of the children of the devil and you single yourself out and you say, I will not be like them anymore. And you cross over by repentance and faith in Christ. Now the children of God are manifest. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. I pray this uniqueness of being born again, of being washed in the blood of the Lamb, and being made white as white as snow, and living in newness of life. I pray by faith, by prayer, by surrender, by total yieldedness unto the Lord. This will become your Lord in Jesus' name. I said it will become your Lord in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two is the oneness of baptized, built up members in his church. Look at that word, 
oneness. That doesn't mean they have the same function. The hand is united with the feet. Have you noticed when you are walking, as you are walking, your hand also unconsciously is moving in line with the moving of your feet. Have you noticed while you are walking, your eyes are looking in the direction in which you are walking? Have you noticed all the time when you are moving that your ears are also hearing sound that will warn you, don't turn there, there is a car coming, don't turn there, you collide with another person. Have you noticed when you are walking, your breathing, your lungs are also functioning along with your walking? What we're saying is all the members of the body, they coordinate together, they cooperate together, and they're united together in whatever activity you may be doing now. When the hand does not cooperate with the head and the feet does not move in the direction that the head is pointing to, we say that person has a mental problem because the head cannot control the members of the body. The members of the body are, di are in discord. They're disunited. And because of that division and disunity, we say that entity, all of them, all of them together, the hands and the feet and the kidney and the heart and the breathing and the brain and the eyes, all of them put together as a person. We we'll say he has mental problem. We we'll say he's lunatic. We we'll say he is insane. Now, if the members of the body of Christ, real members, born again, set apart, cleansed, washed, purified, if they are not united together, they make that body is almost like blasphemy because that's what they do. They make that body with Christ the head, they make that insane. You bring blasphemy into the body when members of the body are not one together. The Lord wants us one. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 19, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers, if you have repented. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers, if you can point to the day, the time, the place, where you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and your life turned around now. Therefore, ye are no more strangers if you are known to heaven, if you are known to Christ, if your name is in the book of life in heaven. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers if the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart, you are a child of God. If your behavior, if your action does not contradict your confession now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens who are the saints and of the household of God. Look at verse 20. And I built upon the foundation. You are baptized, you are integrated into the body of Christ, and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then in verse 21, it says, In whom all the building fitly framed together. If you have a pile of blocks, maybe it's the right size, 
Maybe you pass through, that block has passed through the machine at the right proportion of sand, gravel, and cement, and now it's put aside. That's not a building yet. And there are people that are just like that block, and they are saying, I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm born again. They are not built together. They don't have the mind. They don't have the intention. They don't have the humility. They don't have the lowliness to allow another block to be on top of them, another block to be under them, another block to be on this side of them, another block to be on this side. There are no rangers, and lone rangers will never make a building. The one that thinks of himself alone, thinks of his desires alone. All I want, all I like, everything I want. I don't want that person to be by my side. I don't want that person to be on top of me. And they're always kicking and fighting. They are not built together with the body of Christ. It says in verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into unto an holy temple in the Lord. And then in verse 22, look at what it tells us, in whom ye also are built together. If you are not a stone, a block that is just put aside, beautiful, nice, well constructed, but you are just in isolation. If you are brought in, if you yield yourself and yield your mind and yield your thoughts and yield your character and you are mellow and you are matured, you are part of the body of Christ, built together in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God, for an habitation of God. Think about that. A pile of stones, a heap of sand, gravel, a heap of blocks there. Nobody will go and live there. But it's when those blocks and the cement and the gravel, when they're all brought together and built up into a habitation that God will dwell and live in us. But a scattered church, a divided church, one part there, one part there. They never think alike. They never agree purposefully. And they never have one mind, one faith, one doctrine. Christ will not live there. But in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It emphasizes our oneness. And it's when we are one. The Lord will do wonders among us in Jesus' name. Hey, look at hey, look at John chapter 17, verse 11. John chapter 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. Christ going to heaven. But these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, that they may be one, keep them, that they may be one, secure them, that they may be one, Strengthen them that they may be one. Keep them holy and keep them righteous that they may be one as we are. You can begin to check off in your own heart. You say you're a member of the church, his church. Are you one with the rest of us as the Father? And the son are one. 
Or do you have your own peculiar way, your own peculiar character, your own peculiar disposition, your own peculiar likes, and what you don't like? Are you always wanting, you know? I want it like this, I want it like this. If it is not like that, we'll have to see what you do so that everybody will bow to me, bend to me. But he keeps us, keeps us from Satan. He keeps us from sin. He keeps us from sickness. He keeps us from all the evil of the world that they may be one as we, as we are one. Look at verse 14 there. In verse 14 it says, I've given them thy word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is true. Verse 20. In verse 20, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, these twelve, these initial disciples, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also. You remember the prayer is talking about sanctify them through thy truth. That's the prayer. Thy word is true. Neither am I praying for these first century disciples alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. And why is he praying that prayer for them and for us? Verse 21, that they all may be one. That they all may be one. That they all may be one. If you come to church, and then uh, we we'll see them together. We we'll hear the same word together. We we'll pray to the same Father together. We have Jesus as the same Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer, Coming King together. We have the same Bible together. We're going to the same heaven together. But you are never one. You cannot see eye to eye with the preacher, with the pastor, with the ministers, there is something, an idol in your heart. And you must worship that idol, bend to that idol. And no matter what you enjoy from the body of Christ, your idol is number one in your heart. And you cannot serve God and mammon. And because of that, your idol keeps you away from being one of the church. If you are not one of the people of God here, when you cross over to the other side, you will not stay with them, live with them, dwell with them forever. It takes salvation. And it takes the answer to the prayer of Jesus that it takes that ego, that pride, that divisive spirit, and that carnality away from your life. And then you become an answer to the prayer of Jesus that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. I in him and he in me i in you and you in me if you are in me you'll be thinking the way i think you'll be going the direction i'm going you will support the passion of my heart if i am not only with you but in you we will be planning together, strategizing together, and moving together. And the idol in your heart and the idol in my heart would have been totally burnt up, eradicated. It is that idol, the idol of self, that hinders this unity. But the prayer of Jesus, and you know, 
if you prove Jesus wrong, I see going to be in good condition and terms with you. He prayed for the oneness of the body. And in this local body, in the same deeper life, the same doctrine, the same Father humanly, Father in the Lord, and the same direction, the same program. And yet, if the heart cannot be together, there is something missing in our Christian experience that they all may be one as thou Father art in me and I in thee. That they also, believers, that they also saved and sanctified, that they also, in answer to my prayer, that they also may be one in us, not one outside us, Father and Son, God and the Lord Jesus Christ, not any of us going out and borrowing the philosophy of the world and the program of the world, not that, but all of us, we are in Christ. And we believe the same word and the same doctrine. And it says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. We're praying for souls to be converted. If we are not united, we contradict ourselves, we contradict our prayer. We're praying that the world will believe global global evangelization and we're praying and fasting and sweating and we're praying fervently and some are praying in the day some are praying in the night night vigil morning vigil if we're not one we cancel the effect of our prayer it says that they may be one as we are one that the world may believe that thou has sent me. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, and the glory which thou givest me, I have given them the glory, the power, the splendor, the beauty, the heavenliness that have given me the hedge. I give them why that they may be one not to show up not to brag not to say look how beautiful how powerful i am look at how splendid i am how exalted i am i give them the same glory that you have given me for one purpose and one purpose only that they may be one as we are one. We divest ourselves, we empty ourselves of the glory of heaven when we are not one. We're coming into the kingdom, we're coming and we're integrated into the body of Christ. And then, as soon as we're coming, we forget the reason why we're in. We forget that the reason why we're in. And where grace has been given to us, why special blessings have been given to us, why the glory of Christ is imparted on us, that the reason and the purpose from heaven is that we may be one, even as the Father and the Son are one. And when we forget that, it's like you are running without any purpose anymore. You're moving on without any purpose anymore. You're worshiping without any purpose anymore. You're praying without any purpose anymore. You're having programs and you're moving here and there. You're sweating, you're exerting energy and you're forgetting the purpose. Why? All that glory, all that program, everything is given unto us. It says that they all may be one, even as we are one. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, it tells us it says, is I in them. Hold on. If Christ is in me and Christ is in you, how come we cannot see eye to eye? How come we cannot walk the same direction? If the same Christ inside you, controlling you, 
is the same Christ inside me, controlling me? How is it we cannot understand each other's language? How is it we're not united? How is it you are going this way and I'm going this other way? How is it we're not hearing his voice? I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one that they may be made perfect in one. If we're not united, we'll never be perfect. No matter what experience you claim, you are saved, we're watching. Sanctified, we're watching. You go to pray, and you pray and fast for days, we're watching. You're holding on to the promises of God, we're watching. You're getting ready for the coming of the Lord. We're watching. If all that experience you claim, saved, sanctified, knowledgeable, baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, seeing vision, whatever, you can pray for hours, you can fast for days, if you are not one. For the body, for the people of God, there's no way you'll ever be perfect. Fasting without perfection, praying without perfection, giving tithes and offering without perfection, running up and down without perfection. And then Christ comes, and the very one thing is looking for that oneness, that perfection is not there. You have labored in vain, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. About 2,000 years ago, Christ came to this world. He died on the cross of Calvary. And there are many people. Now the world is about 7 billion people. And 1 billion people have not known that Christ came up for them. And they are dying every day. And every day, the other day I said 120,000 people die every day. I went back to check up in the present records, more than 150,000 people die every day. Many of them have not known the Lord. And then our little toy idol were concentrating on in the local church and were not thinking of the people that need to know about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ and that little toy idol is so important to us we're not united to take the gospel and to take it to the rest of the world that the world will know that Christ has been saved he died 2,000 years ago and the majority of the world today have not known. There are young people there, they need to know. There are boys and girls, they need to know. There are men and women, they need to know. And we're too busy dealing, we're too busy liking our ice cream and, and licking our ice cream. And our ice cream is hindering us from seeing the vision of the world that is yet ignorant that Jesus came to save them why don't we drop this ice cream and drop all these toys so that we can fulfill the oneness and the unity why Jesus came that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me as loved them as thou hast loved me. That's the reason he wants us, a real member 
of Christ. He wants us to be one, to be united. Stop thinking about your own ideology and your own likes and dislikes and think about what Christ has brought so that with united vision and the united force and united skill and united power, we can reach the world and make the world to know that Christ has come for them. We will be one. I said, we will be one. You know, I know those who sing uh, that chorus, we are one, we are one. While they are singing that chorus, their heart is in discord. Maybe against their husband, maybe against their wife. While they are singing that, they are only catering and appreciating their local little corner of workers in our church. And they don't think or care about the rest of us. Sing it, believe it, act it, show it that they all may be one. And as we are one, the Spirit of God will move mightily in our midst in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostle chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. No argument between James and John. And there's no disunity between Andrew and Peter. Hey, hold on, Peter. I brought you to Christ. So sit down here. And then there's nothing between the mother of Jesus and the rest of them. Hey, everybody, you're talking about Jesus. I am the virgin mother of Jesus. So give me a chance. Let me talk. And I was no, there was no um, kind of argument between Matthew and Thomas. Thomas, who do you think is greater? Me, that I'm going to write the gospel according to St. Matthew. What are you going to write? What position do you have? What gauge do you have? There was no discord, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. If we are not united, the new day of Pentecost will not come for us. We'll just be there. We'll be shallow. We'll be dry will be empty, will be powerless, will be impotent. It is when we're all with one accord, the Spirit of God will find a place to work. When they were all with one accord, we're told in verse 2. Then it says in verse 2 there, it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Heaven will recognize us when we're all united, when we're one in heart, in mind, in vision, in focus, in drive, in direction, and there's no criticism in our little corner, wherever we are. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they were told in verse 3, it says, and they appeared unto them clubbing tongues like a of fire. But pray, let the fire fall, let the fire fall, let the Pentecostal fire fall. There will be no fire without unity. There will be no fervency without unity. There will be no revival without unity. Our sacrifice will be cold on the altar. And the fire of heaven will not come upon that sacrifice when there is no unity. They were all with one accord in one place and therefore they appeared unto them, clothing tongues like a of fire. And it sat on each of them, all of them. And it sat on each of them. You know, sometimes we preach, pray, all the sinners there are not converted. The grace does not come on each of them. We preach and we pray, and all those who need to be sanctified, not all are sanctified. The grace of sanctification does not come on everyone, on each of them. And then we preach and pray, and the power of the Holy Ghost does not come on everyone, on each of them. And the burden of evangelism, the fire of evangelism, the fervency in prayer does not come upon everyone. 
there's no unity. We don't have the same heart and the same mind and the same passion and the same vision, but it says, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a sapphire, and it sat on each of them. And then in verse 4, it tells us, and they were all, and they were all, and they were all. They all got it at the time of Christ. Healing, they were all healed, saved, they were all saved sanctified them through the truth they were all sanctified and wait for the power from heaven and they were all filled encouraged they were all encouraged and then the the whole church addressed and they moved on everyone in the fear of the lord and the word of god increased they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak all of them and began to speak all of them uh, with all the talks as the Spirit gave them uh, utterance. And I pray this unity will bring uh, the fullness of the Spirit of God in our midst and on every heart in Jesus' name. Look at verse 39. There, verse 39 says, The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the lord our god shall call it will happen Amen. to us it will happen Amen. to you and to me it will happen Amen. and the power of god will become unlimited in every one of our lives in jesus name Look at point number three here, the unselfishness of burden-bearing members for the commission. The unselfishness, unselfishness, unselfishness of burden-bearing members for the commission. Thank God for the great commission. Thank God for the whole of the church bearing that burden, lifting that burden. Thank God there's no one sitting back. Why is it over there? Why not here? Thank God there's nobody saying the pastor should not go any other place. Here is where he should always be. Whether the other people are thirsty and hungry and passionate and fasting and prayer and demanding, no problem. Here is where it should always stay. Thank God there are no people like that. But if there are people like that, we have not heard them to voice it out. If we're going to see the world evangelized, if we're going to see people brought out of their darkness, out of their evil, out of their imprisonment, out of their captivity, out of their confinement. If we're going to see the gospel flowing out, reaching out, if we're going to see the world penetrating into millions and millions of hearts, Number one, you must become unselfish. Unselfish. Not only me and my house, not only me and my relatives, not only me and our local church, not only me and our headquarters church, we must become unselfish and the same heart and the same mind that Christ has for the rest of the world, for the whole world, we must have the might of Christ in us and bear the burden, the burden of our weary world, wanting everyone to hear the gospel. Are there people among us that as we're having this global thrust of crusades, you ought to link up, but anybody there to, that will say i will not link up if the faith is going to come from another place to me i reject when they bring it here and we know it is 
our program. This one is not their program. Then I'll be there. Are you as zealous? Are you as committed? When it goes, it comes from other places. Or are you like, I don't know what to make of all this. We must be unselfish if we're going to bear bodies. Anything we're doing, uh, you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it that they may hear, that they may know, that they may believe, that they may come into the kingdom of God. I pray every form of selfishness, the Lord will wipe away from every heart in Jesus' name. From your heart. From your heart. Amen. Amen. You know, sometimes, if we're not careful, we can negate the sanctification we're preaching. If you tell people under your local leadership not to mind that, not to connect with that, not to go that direction, because they have not brought us, our people, our group, our little section into it, you might be teaching them against the sanctification of their heart, teaching them against the oneness in the body, and teaching them to fight what they ought to support, and allowing the work of God to crumble and to scatter just because of the carnal, selfish, Adamic depravity in your heart. But when we pray and we stretch ourselves and lay ourselves on the altar and selfishness is totally taken away and we have the unselfishness of body-bearing members, the commission will be fulfilled through you and through me in Jesus name Amen Galatians chapter 6 we're reading from verse 2 Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ bear carry lift up the bodies of other people so that we fulfill the law of Christ. When we think of problems, maybe everybody wants, everybody perhaps one way or the other has problem. But look at what God has done for you. Look at the goodness of God, the grace of God, the, 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 the possibilities in your life. Although there are little, little things that, you know, the broom of the Holy Spirit will st uh, still sweep up, but look at the great things the Lord has done for you. And then other people, if you're still saying, until all problems are solved, I'm not going to take part, that's selfish. Until this is cleared and that is cleared, I'm not going to take part, that's selfish. Until they look at our area and they give me this and they give me this and, you know, money is available. They have money for crusade. They must have money for me. I'm not having something to eat. Until that is done, I'm not going to, you know, unite with the people of God. You'll be waiting too long. The Lord is saying, be, uh, bear ye the body, one another's body, and in that way fulfill the law of Christ. I pray God will help every one of us in Jesus' name. You will bear others' bodies. You will carry others' loads. And you will help others to be happier. You will help others to be what they ought to be in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not us. You remember John? John is that disciple 
whom Jesus loved. John is that disciple who would lean his head upon the bosom of Jesus and he wanted to monopolize the love of Christ. He wanted to monopolize the virtue coming from Christ. John, the selfish, maybe you are like that. You have a privileged position in the church and then you see other people and they might get to the position Christ will allow them to lean upon his bosom. Say, what are you doing there? Who brought you there? Don't you know that that special position belongs to so and so? We saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, and because he followeth not us. Look at verse 50. Verse 50 tells us, and Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not. John, you know what? You are not of the same mind with Christ. Christ does not want you to shield out anyone, to block out anyone, and you are busy going about. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And Jesus said, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Look at Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, reading from verse 27. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad, do prophesy in the camp. He had his own share. He prophesied, Caleb by the soul share, he prophesied, 68 of them at the own share, and they prophesied, but Eldad and Medad were in the camp, and the Lord also gave them the same gift, Joshua. What are you thinking about? Are you more zealous than God? Are you more passionate than God? Do you know who to do that, who not to do that more than God? The God of heaven gave them the same gift, these two people, as he gave to the 68. And then uh, this Joshua ran, a young man, and he told Moses and said, Elder the maiden, do prophesy in the camp. Verse 28, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Selfishness, selfishness. Were it not that Joshua took correction and he allowed that selfishness to be extracted, to be uprooted, to be cleansed up, to be burnt up? from his heart and his life, he would never have become the leader he became. He said, they said, this is a servant of Moses. And he said, my Lord, Moses, forbid them. But thank God for a leader like Moses. There are some leaders, they only listen to what their selfish subordinates tell them. Sir, look at these two people. Yes, we know they are doing good, but did you give them instruction? Look at these two people. They are sending forth the message. They are even more active than we are. Did you give them authority? And they speak because of their selfishness. Thank God for Moses. I said thank God for Moses. And I pray we thank God for you. Ah, you said amen. When I said thank God for when I said thank God for Moses, you said amen. And now when I say thank God for you, then you said amen. I'm going to start that again. Thank God for Moses. And now I thank God for you. You know, people, if you come to tell the pastor. So, Midad, Elder, they're doing this, they're doing this. And the pastor says, Leave them alone. 
we are all working for God. They come another time. They have not learned from that first lesson. They need to go to God, extract that selfishness from their heart, that depravity, that carnality from their heart. They come again, sir. So and so, so and so. They're doing this, they're doing this. They do permit them. Leave them alone. Okay, okay. We'll never come and tell him anything. All the time, leave them alone. All the time, leave them alone. Let's all pray that in my heart there will be no carnality. In your heart there will be no carnality. In our sisters there will be no carnality. In our young people and youths there will be no carnality. In our children there will be no carnality. And when we have the nature of Christ, the love of Christ, and then the passion of Christ moving us on without any selfishness, we will take this nation for Christ in Jesus' name. Look at Moses, and Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake, envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord will put his spirit upon them, upon you, upon them, upon our sisters, upon our brothers, upon everyone in Jesus' name. My brother, district pastor there, I grew pastor there, if you heard somebody got sick and instead of coming to you, they went to the next door brother, the next door sister because of the urgency. And then the brother, didn't you want to ask them, did you tell the district pastor? Did you tell group pastor? And he just they dressed up and he got there and then he prayed and a miracle happened. And then we come on Thursday, and the, this person said, you are looking at me here, I would have been dead since Wednesday. But I called brother so-and-so. Didn't mention the name of the pastor and the name of the group pastor and the name of the church representative. He said, I called brother so-and-so, and I'm telling you, the moment he came and mentioned the name of Jesus, I was healed, and I will feel stronger than I ever was. What do you do to that testimony? Maybe you come to the pulpit and say, now everybody pay attention. Know how you give testimony. We're not here to exalt any man. We're not here to exalt any woman. I hear you, sir. If they had mentioned your name and showed you of the Elijah of today, and they said, I called the group pastor, I called the pastor, this say pastor, and when he came, he just mentioned the name of Jesus. It was like the GS praying short and straightforward, and then everything went away. I'm alive today. You will come there and say, everybody, did you hear that testimony? Praise the Lord God is at work. I say, God, it has work. And it's just seeing everybody, even my little self here, you are running to this, you are running to that. But should I want to tell you that God's power is here? I love that. Say the same thing when the miracle happens through somebody that we don't know. So that there will be no selfishness, there will be no carnality. There'll be no ego. We'll all join hands together and we'll move together. And the power of God will never stop in our church in Jesus' name. Those good old days are coming back again. In your life, they're coming back. In your family, they're coming back. In our districts, they're coming back. And I've been telling you before that I pass the power on to you. Today is different. You will be on fire. I can't see the people on fire. Where are you? You will be on fire in Jesus' name. 
open your mouth, open your mouth, and let God speak to you today while you are praying. Let the fire fall, let the fire fall, and let the power from heaven fall upon every thirsty soul. And tell the Lord, I'll be one, I'll be united with the people of God, I'll be one, I'll be united, all the carnality and all the depravity and all those things, uh, you know, that have been making me only myself, my little self, and you have an idol there that you are protecting, tell the Lord that all that idol, the Lord will take away from your heart and you will have, you will have a genuine sanctification and genuine oneness and genuine unity with the people of God in Jesus' name. Tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him. Open your heart, open your life, examine yourself. Have you been selfish? Examine yourself. Have you been thinking of yourself? Examine yourself. Are you full of self? Are you full of self? Are you full of carnality? Are you full of depravity? You tell the Lord, oh Lord, walk in my heart. Walk in my soul. Walk in my spirit. Take all this away and take all this selfishness and division and disunity. Take all that away, away from my heart. Are you sure you are born again? Your sins are forgiven. The Spirit of God bears witness with your heart. You're a real child of God. It's your name in the book of life in heaven. The change, the transformation, the life of the new creature as that be worked out, operational, functional in your life, Born again. Are you born again? If the engrafted word in your heart, are you receiving the word of God with meekness and lowliness? Or is there pride there? Pride has come in. And pride stands at the door of your heart. I will not allow the word to penetrate. Receive the word with meekness. Have a unique Christian life. Spotless Christian life. Live the life of the kingdom. Kingdom life. Kingdom behavior. Kingdom righteousness, kingdom love, kingdom yieldedness, are you integrated into the body of Christ? Built up, are you an isolated block? No ranger. All you see is yourself. All you know is your need. Are you full of yourself? Are you fully surrendered unto the Lord? No idol, no pride, no ego, no toy that you are playing with as a baby, and in that you. From having the vision of the regions beyond. Always.
always angry at nothing. Angry at what makes Christ happy. You have the same mind with Christ? The same love as Christ? The same devotion as Christ? The same pursuit as Christ? He prayed for our sanctification. While there's selfishness there, sanctification has not yet taken place. When there's carnality there, self-defense, self-promotion, sanctification has not entered in. What a self-centeredness there, self-consideration there, sanctification has not entered in. Where me, 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 I, my territory, my terrain, my dominion, my assignment, my privilege, my position, my place, where that is, sanctification has not entered in. Bring that self to the altar. Have it crucified. Present the old man, the old nature unto Christ. Let that theme be crucified and the body of sin destroyed. Then will you profess sanctification. Then will self, selfishness quit the throne of your heart. Then will you be one for the rest of the church? As the Father and the Son are one. And then will you give a chance? For the gospel to reach the world, that the world may believe that the Father art in me and I in thee, and that they may all be one in us. Don't just come to church. Let everything we're hearing penetrate your heart. And pray that from this day, your life will be different. Your attitude will be different. Your disposition will be different. become really unique, an instrument of unity for the church of the living God. And let the unity begin at home. Charity begins at home. Unity begins at home. Love begins at home. Let the children see father and mother are one. 
as God and Christ are one. The children and the parents are one. As God, the Father, and God, the Son, are one. The members of the church are one. Well, the ministers, as God and Christ, are one. Assurance that your name is in the book of life in heaven. And you live as one having the heavenly recognition. And then pray that as you are one, sanctified, purified, and that make nature taken away, that the fire, the power of the Holy Ghost will be upon your life. Fire, power, fervency, strength from on high will be in your life and Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost will fill you saturate you empower you envelop you and then there will be great possibilities of the spirit in your life as you are one united for the body of Christ.